Billions of microorganisms accompany humans from birth onward and are crucial for our health and survival. In recent years, microbiome research has been able to link more and more ailments to a bacterial imbalance in the intestinal tract, including many modern-day diseases such as obesity and high blood pressure. Doctors and researchers have begun to use the helpful bacteria, fungi and archaea in our internal organs to ward off, alleviate and cure diseases such as diabetes and cancer. Even the coronavirus is being looked at. The clever healers in the gut are increasingly becoming the wonder weapon microbiome in the medical world. This young woman is a nutritionist and cook. Right now, she's shopping in bulk. When we go shopping, we're not just shopping for ourselves. We're really shopping for billions of little lodgers, little housemates with whom we live in symbiosis and without whom we couldn't really live at all. The daily food choices we make actually have enormous medicinal potential because we can influence our health quite strongly, namely the growth of good intestinal bacteria. What Andrea Ficella buys here at Vienna's Naschmarkt open market doesn't look like luxury food, yet it is the basis for a real gourmet menu. Today we're cooking a first-rate menu for billions, and it will also be super cheap. But before you can spoil the intestinal bacteria with a gourmet menu, they have to colonize their host. Before we're born, humans are for the most part completely bacteria-free. The microbes come later. Nicolas Maximilian was born on the 23rd of December at the University Hospital in Graz. He was born prematurely in the 23rd week of pregnancy and weighed just under 900 grams. It's fascinating what babies can actually endure and how they develop. I'm very proud of how my little one has coped so well. He couldn't have made it on his own, despite all his mother's love and the miracle of modern medicine. People can only survive in combination with the bacteria that can be found throughout the human body. All the inner cavities are colonized, and the outer parts of the skin, the largest organ of the human body, and we have more microbes on and in us than there are cells comprising our entire bodies. We have more microorganisms on us and in us than there are people on the planet. The number of microorganisms in our body is relatively stable, but the composition of the microbes is decisive for health. In recent years, it has been shown that C-section deliveries can have a negative effect on the intestinal flora and that, as a result, ailments such as allergies, digestive problems and asthma can occur more often. It also makes a difference whether the birth takes place in a plant-rich environment or at home in a cool, hygienically clean environment. All of this interacts with and shapes the microbiome. Most premature babies being cared for here in the Graz neonatology department are born via caesarean section. To avoid poor colonization of the intestine, the children are given a special microbiome boost. It consists of an antibiotic that acts locally in the intestine against the often problematic germs from the hospital environment and a probiotic that promotes colonization with helpful microbes. A broad, protective microbiome develops better and more rapidly this way than if you gave them only the antibiotic or only the probiotic. This method has made our complication rates quite low and the percentage of the dreaded disease, necrotizing enterocolitis, is less than 1%. In any case, Nicolas Maximilian has the worst behind him and can look forward to a bright future. I've had two miscarriages, and thank God I have my miracle baby now. Charlotte Schicker-Grabin also has a small miracle baby. Following a liver transplant due to an autoimmune disease, it wasn't certain that she could get pregnant. Her liver problem was just one in a series of illnesses that began in childhood. 
I was often ill as a child. I had frequent angina, ear infections, fever, and back then you were often given antibiotics. I can still remember the liquid I had to drink. I think it did a lot to my intestines, because I often had intestinal problems, a lot of stomach aches. I constantly had gastrointestinal diarrhea and that sort of thing. I think the antibiotics had something to do with it. Frequent administration of antibiotics does in fact lead to a reduced diversity of intestinal bacteria. It can also affect the so-called intestinal barrier, which plays an important role in liver diseases. Here in Graz, disorders of this barrier are simulated using tumor cells. Bacterial products enter the metabolism. Then there is immune activation. And this immune activation and these inflammatory mediators then cause the metabolism to deteriorate. According to recent findings in microbiome research, this problem is potentially one of the main causes of the growing obesity epidemic in countries that have an abundance of food, but at the same time too little variety in the diet. Incidentally, obesity is often accompanied by sarcopenia, the name given to a severe loss of muscle mass. The microbiome is probably a key factor in both phenomena. A diet that contains too much fat and sugar is often the cause of what's known as metabolic syndrome, which leads to diabetes, obesity, high blood pressure, and elevated blood lipids. To put it bluntly, you could say that an altered microbiome causes the muscles to shrink and the belly to grow. Right now we're looking at how the gut microbiome is linked to sarcopenia in a very large research project. It's not only antibiotics that can reduce diversity, diet also plays an important role. Take vegetables, for example. In recent decades, the variety of vegetables in industrial agriculture has declined just as much as it has in home kitchens. It not only makes no sense ecologically to eat the same products all year round, but it's also not good for intestinal health. Eating tomatoes, cucumbers and strawberries all year round requires a lot of energy and the variety is limited. And that's a shame because there are great vegetables that grow even in cold weather. In addition, vegetables in particular contain a large amount of dietary fiber. The long chain carbohydrates and cabbage and the like are actually extremely valuable and nutritious for the billions of microorganisms inside us even though they provide only a few calories for the host itself. That's a great advantage, not only for losing weight. Dietary fibers are important substances that reach the large intestine and serve as food for the intestinal bacteria, where they produce short-chain fatty acids. Butyric acid, for example which is also very important for the intestinal mucosa. This mucous membrane is crucial for the intestinal barrier, and that's how we come back full circle to Charlotte Schicker-Grabin and her little miracle baby. Only the daily intake of probiotics, specially produced for her at Med Uni Graz, brought her antibiotic-damaged microbiome back into balance and helped her to become pregnant. There is already a lot of evidence that the microbiome also plays an important role in the gynecological field. Not only the intestinal microbiome, but also the microbiome in the urogenital tract. In recent decades, young women who have had transplants have often been told to not even bother trying to get pregnant. But of course, it's a normal part of life, and many young women want to get pregnant even after such a difficult operation. So it's good to know different mechanisms you can use to increase fertility. I feel much better. I can eat more again. I don't have to be as careful now. Before, I couldn't eat gluten. I had extreme reflux where the food came back up after I ate. I had a very bloated stomach so that it looked like I was pregnant, even though I wasn't. 
It's gotten a lot better. I'm in a Facebook group in which there are a lot of people from Austria and Germany who have had liver transplants. Again and again I see doctors advising people not to take probiotics if they've had a transplant. I often write that this is actually no longer right and that there needs to be a rethinking. I know it because I've experienced it myself. I was given this probiotic directly after the transplant in the hospital. I took it in consultation with the doctors and it did me a lot of good. Matteo, who was born by a C-section in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic due to a false positive test, is now taking his probiotic together with this courageous mum and will certainly only be given antibiotics if ever really necessary. After all, we know more nowadays about the great importance of a functioning microbiome than we did when his mother was a child. You'd go to your GP and he'd say, it's not that bad, but just to be on the safe side, we'll give you an antibiotic so it doesn't get any worse. That's how I remember it. Whether antibiotics have played a role in the development of Claudia Weiss's inflammatory bowel disease hasn't been scientifically determined. But the 57-year-old has been suffering from a severe form of ulcerative colitis since 2013. Terrible diarrhea with lots of cramps, bloody stool, having to go to the toilet many times, even at night, nausea, various side effects that affect the eyes where you become sensitive to light, where your life is quite limited. How do I get from A to B? It's not possible at all to go by public transport, because if you have to go to the toilet urgently, it's simply not possible. It's possible to go by car with your own vehicle. You develop strategies for when you go somewhere, because you know exactly how many opportunities there will be to go to the toilet along the way. I've always looked up things in advance before I go, where there are rest stops on the motorway. Claudia Weiss is very open about her illness. She doesn't let it get her down, although ulcerative colitis certainly has the potential to be the cause for despair. My mom is really strong, which is certainly not the case for everyone. From my studies, I know that this can be a great psychological burden for some people. It's not an easy subject for anyone, and in the long run, it's of course very draining. The suffering is enormous for patients, and that's tough, because you can't see the problem outwardly. People, even in their relationships, withdraw socially, even when they have their whole lives ahead of them. It's difficult at work, difficult with friends, difficult with family. So that weighs on a person on many levels. If you can help them, that's especially rewarding, and the patients are especially grateful. Claudia Weiss found help. She has been much better since the end of January 2021, thanks to the enthusiasm of two gastrointestinal specialists for stool transplants based in Graz. They used a very simple tool from the home appliances section. This is a medically historical food processor. Austria's first donor stool was prepared here at the Graz University Hospital in 2011 using this conventional multifunctional kitchen blender. Ten years ago, we performed the first stool transplant in Graz. There was a patient in intensive care, a young woman, who had a very serious intestinal inflammation that couldn't be treated any other way. Within the team, we then decided to try it on this young patient, and it was a great success. We were able to cure her, and she probably wouldn't be alive today otherwise. You can see how great the despair is because a stool transplant isn't something where you shout, yes, please, I'd like to be the first to get it. It's something where you think, oh, I'd rather have a sterile syringe. In the meantime, hundreds of patients with severe intestinal diseases have been successfully treated in Graz within the framework of medical studies. Claudia Weiss also felt much better after receiving donor stool over the course of several colonoscopic interventions. I've had it five times. The first time was in November, then 14 days apart. 
I noticed things were better after the very first time. The number of times I have to go to the bathroom has decreased by half. I still have to go to the toilet at night, but only once instead of two or three times. So it's a lot less. Until recently, stool from various bowel-healthy donors was used, often from relatives, friends or acquaintances of the recipient. In the study that Claudia Weiss is taking part in, all the patients are receiving transplants with stool from a single donor who has a particularly healthy and diverse microbiome. Doctors internally call such showcase donors the golden geese and now want to try using them for experimental cancer therapy as well. We're looking for patients from all over Austria who are interested in participating. If anyone feels qualified to be a donor, they're most welcome. Perhaps he or she will become the golden goose of tumor therapy. <laughs> tumor therapy is one of the great new areas of hope in connection with the microbiome. The most modern cancer therapies are those that target immune cells of the patient's own body against a tumor and arm them in a manner of speaking. The problem is that not all patients are really helped by this immunotherapy with checkpoint inhibitors. Others develop severe side effects, for example, in the intestine. But if I change their microbiome, for example, through a stool transplant, then I can re-stimulate a response. In other words, by changing the intestinal microbiome, the patient's immune situation is re-enabled in the direction of an immune therapy and also the side effects, namely these autoimmune phenomena, that is, the immune cells that attack a person's own body. We know these intestinal inflammations, the liver inflammations, but also inflammations of the pancreas. These also seem to be dependent on the individual microbiome. The fascinating thing is, it might be possible that the microbiome can also be used to transplant therapeutic success against cancer. We take the stool from patients who have had no indication of a tumor for more than a year due to checkpoint inhibitors. These are all patients who have had metastases from malignant melanoma and so on. We take their stool and give it to patients who don't respond to checkpoint inhibitors in malignant melanoma and hope to achieve a response. There is already some preliminary data from the lab and also a first trial series with 10 patients that shows that this could amount to something. So we are really excited about it. There is a trend towards developing microbiome medicines based on stool germs. They're not like the usual probiotics that you can currently buy in pharmacies. These are medicines actually produced from human stool germs but are standardized and have been tested in clinical trials. We expect that the first medicines could come to the market in the next three to five years. There are currently three studies taking place. It's no wonder that the pioneers of stool transplants are still fascinated by the possibilities of microbiome transfers, despite the somewhat problematic material they're working with. Of course, it's somehow bizarre. I can't talk about my work over dinner with friends, for example. That doesn't go down too well. Certainly not if there's chocolate mousse for dessert. I myself don't find it at all disgusting. You come to see it completely differently. Andrea Ficciala also likes to work with kitchen appliances, albeit in a completely different way. Here she is preparing a real delicacy for a healthy intestinal microbiome. Cabbage contains mustard oil glycosides, and on the one hand, they help promote the good bacteria in the intestine. And on the other hand, they keep the bacteria in check that we don't want, the ones that tend to lead to inflammation, for example. And that's why she likes making cabbage pesto, for instance. Nowadays, people don't eat a lot of cabbage. So you can make a pesto and put it in the fridge, or even freeze it, and then use it for sauces or on a salad. Or you can use it as a kind of herb or as a spread. Then you're really feeding the gut bacteria every day or every few days with a very good food, and you can encourage growth. Another way to keep gut bacteria happy is with cabbage chips, which take only a few minutes to make in the oven. The heat makes them easier to digest. 
precisely those substances that promote flatulence. One benefit is that the heat draws out the water, so the fiber and ingredients become very compressed per 100 grams. The flatulence is nothing bad. It's just a sign that the intestinal bacteria are having a party. And as with any party, it can get a bit annoying if it gets too loud. But it's nothing bad. There's even a saying, the noisier the fart, the healthier the heart. There's some truth to that. There might even be a connection to the COVID-19 pandemic. It's still not clear why some people suffer such severe long cases of COVID despite having a strong immune system. Florian Polsterer, for example, isn't only extremely athletic, but has also been successfully strengthening his defense for years with cold water treatments. Nevertheless, COVID-19 hit him hard at the beginning of the second wave in autumn 2020. I was afraid because it was very unfamiliar. I'd never been so ill before and I'd never had to be admitted to hospital before. I thought I'd only have a mild case and didn't expect it to hurt so much. Anita Beck, on the other hand, was one of the first COVID patients in Austria when she fell ill in March 2020. At the time, she was in her early 50s, had no underlying health conditions, and because the pandemic wasn't really an issue at the time, she initially thought it was a harmless flu-like infection that would quickly subside. And then from one minute to the next, it got really much worse. I panicked and couldn't breathe. Then my husband said, let's go to the hospital now. I thought, yes, OK, now you're going somewhere where someone can examine you where you can get your blood values checked, your heart checked, an x-ray, so you'll know what's what, because I had no idea. I didn't know if it was normal or what was happening in my body. It's quite frightening. Anita Beck is affected by long-term COVID and still suffers from the impact, especially to her lungs, more than a year after the infection. She's bravely fighting it, with a lot of exercise and an even healthier diet than before the pandemic. Fortunately, Florian Polsterer recovered quickly from his surprisingly severe case of COVID without any long-term effects, which might also have something to do with this diet, which has always been particularly healthy. One of the answers to the question of why the severity of a COVID-19 infection can vary so much might have something to do with the infected person's microbiome. This is all very new with COVID-19. We've known about the disease for a little more than a year, but research is also going that direction, that it might be possible to improve a patient's treatment by modulating the microbiome. Numerous fungi and more than 100,000 harmless viral species are also part of the human microbiome, and this could be particularly important in COVID diseases. For example, some complications of COVID-19 are fungal infections that can occur in the lungs. They occur relatively early. These fungal infections occur with varying frequency all over the world, from about 3% to over 30% in all intensive care patients. And when these fungal infections occur, then unfortunately, the survival of these patients is also massively impaired. The microbiome and also the mycobiome, that would be the fungi that also live in us, play a special role because the therapy that we use to treat COVID-19 and the changes that COVID-19 causes in the microbiome and mycobiome cause a predisposition for such super infections. In addition, our intestine is the largest immune organ in the whole body. The microbiome is therefore also heavily involved in fighting off infection. And there is an additional link between microbial colonization in the gut and lung diseases. So, of course, it is also clear that a disturbed intestinal flora, as can be seen in intensive care patients, has an indirect influence on the lung's immune system the defense is correspondingly weakened in the lungs and secondary microbes, for example, in the oral flora, settle in the lungs and then lead to pneumonia and secondary infections, which can then also be fought less effectively by the body if the intestinal microbiome is disturbed at the same time. 
bekämpft werden können, wenn gleichzeitig das Darmmikrobiom gestört wird. That's why research is also being done here at the Medical University of Graz on tissue samples from COVID patients, for example from the intestine and lungs. This has been happening since the beginning of the pandemic under the stricter safety precautions which not only complicate the laboratory work but also our ability to film it. You can't see a virus. Theoretically, it can form in the air, for instance, in aerosols. So even if you're only working there in the laboratory test area, you can, of course, carry that out and infect someone. That's why it's also a negative pressure laboratory, which means that everything that's in there stays trapped inside. The findings of the microbiome researchers in Graz, obtained under the most difficult circumstances, may no longer play a role in the current pandemic thanks to vaccines. But epidemics have always impacted people and their billions of tiny inhabitants. And that will continue to be the case in the future. Moreover, infections are far from humanity's only hostage. We were in the Diocesan Museum, and the first thing I noticed when I saw carvings of St. Wilgefortis or St. Criminus was that patients of mine also had such a beard and found it difficult to epilate it, shave it off, and suffered massively from it. The depiction of Christ in women's clothing, which so moved the hormone and microbiome expert Barbara Obermeyer pitch the first time she saw it, has nothing to do with the history of medicine. St. Cumanis actually arose out of a cultural misunderstanding. Someone from the area north of the Alps came to Italy and saw Jesus Christ there, who was traditionally depicted on the cross with a tunic, i.e. with a long robe, and thought to himself, back home only women wear long robes, so this must be a bearded woman on the cross. That is how the legend of St. Cumanis and everything related to it came to be. Nevertheless, many women suffer from a disease with the unwieldy name polycystic ovary syndrome, PCOS for short, which is often also accompanied by strong hair growth and even a beard, and which is probably strongly influenced by the microbiome. These are women who have a distinct beard growth. They often also suffer from hair loss on their head. And sometimes they also have fertility disorders, cycle difficulties, or often no cycle at all. This can lead to an inability to have children in about 20 to 30 percent of cases. With all the others, it's not a problem. And they also tend to have a metabolic change. Some become very obese. About half of them gain a lot of weight because the insulin is strongly increased in these patients. And because of the frequent meals, they of course gain weight. It was already a problem in my early youth, when my friends had no body hair or much less body hair than I did, and my menstrual cycle was non-existent or very irregular, which is of course a sign of femininity. It was quite a problem for me. Now 27 years old, she's lost more than 40 kilograms since the age of 18 by discovering her love for triathlon and cycling and by changing her diet. I'm a dietitian, and nutrition plays an important role in this setting. I fought my way into the subject and tried out nutritional therapies on myself. I was able to achieve success. My cycle is now much more regular, and I also feel much better about myself. Her own fate has not only turned the young woman into a sought-after specialist, but has also motivated her to take part in a large study in which special probiotics are used to combat polycystic ovary syndrome. The findings could soon benefit not only women with PCOS, but also diabetics. In type 2 diabetes in particular, we see similar changes as with PCO syndrome. There's a deterioration of the intestinal microbiome, i.e. there are fewer diverse strains, there is less variety. And that's an expression of, and also unfortunately a reason for, a metabolic disturbance. Tamara Bernfeind is also taking part in the study and takes probiotics produced by the University Clinic in Graz every day. 
or maybe it's a placebo. No one knows at this stage of the scientific work. The young woman from Styria never had to struggle with abnormal hair growth. But she has a severe hormone and insulin imbalance due to the microbiome. In my case, it mainly manifested itself in an irregular menstrual cycle, very rapid weight gain and a lot of tiredness. And especially the hormones, when they get a bit out of balance, then you have to deal with more mood swings. In my case, I also had increased menstrual pain, and that definitely limited me. But in the meantime, 10 years have passed, and I can better classify symptoms, where they come from, and I can also deal with them better. Tamara Bernfeind also tries to alleviate her symptoms by changing her diet. This is quite difficult because the bacteria in her microbiome not only affect her insulin and hormone levels, but also send out messenger substances that can influence the brain and thus apparently her free will. You definitely notice, especially when you change your diet, that your whole body is fighting against it and you want to eat things again that you really shouldn't, and that it's a bit of an addiction that you're fighting against. So I can imagine that the intestinal bacteria are also rebelling. But the power of the microbiome goes much further. Barbara Obermeyer-Pitch and her team are also researching the interaction between intestinal colonization and the effectiveness of drugs. Of course, the microbiota changes the drugs quite a lot. It starts with aspirin, which is actually metabolized before it enters the body. This means that the tablet itself is not what works, but what works is what comes into the bloodstream via the intestinal metabolism, via the microbes. About 50% of the medicines or drugs we take don't work. This is where it gets exciting, of course, because we first want to understand why they don't work. Many drugs work via the microbiome, i.e. they modulate the microbiome or depend on a change through the microbiome. And in 50%, for example, this does not seem to work. Or there are increased side effects. These side effects are often triggered by substances that the microbes produce from the medicines provided. Conversely, however, drugs can also strongly alter the intestinal microbiome. This applies not only to antibiotics, which also kill good bacteria, but also to drugs that are too often used lightly under the terms acid blockers, proton pump inhibitors, or gastric protectors, because the microbiome already begins in the oral cavity. When we take proton pump inhibitors, or as we also say, a stomach lining protector, what happens is that the stomach produces less stomach acid and more bacteria can survive this stomach barrier. This means that every time we eat or swallow something or brush our teeth, bacteria from the oral microbiome pass through the stomach, where they would be killed by the normal stomach barrier. In other words, the stomach acid, directly into the intestine. There, of course, they are no longer as beneficial to health as they are in the mouth. Speaking of health, these enigmatic tiny creatures could play a decisive role not only in the effectiveness of medicines. Archaea are perhaps the oldest part of our microbiome, tiny creatures that have only recently been detected all over the human body using the most modern methods and have amazing properties. Medically, it's still very difficult with the archaea, because up to now not a single pathogenic representative, i.e. not a single pathogenic agent among the archaea is known. This is really exciting because we know that relatively many bacterial representatives are also pathogens or fungi. With the archaea, it's completely different. There's not a single pathogen identified so far, and that makes it extremely exciting, especially since we know that archaea can also be found in the human intestine, or on the human skin, in the oral cavity, and everywhere. So why shouldn't they also be pathogens? And that's what we're researching. Maybe it's because archaea could be our direct relatives in a way. Archaea may even be the ancestors of all life on Earth. 
Karin Meusel-Eichinger is therefore also involved in NASA's Mars missions as a researcher. No one was there to see how life arose here on Earth. But there is, of course, the notion of panspermia and the possibility that life, for example, could have been transferred to Earth from Mars, which was possibly inhabited at the time, and that could well have been the Archaea. That is why we are now explicitly looking for Archaea on Mars. It's currently assumed that the Archaea are also the ancestors of organisms that have developed further. This means that the microbiome is no longer simply a foreign colonization of the intestine, but our ancient connection to all life on this planet. Gabriele Berg of the Graz University of Technology is researching these connections intensively. It's striking that microbiomes have changed in recent years. Approximately since the beginning of the Anthropocene, where humans are really very intensively and actively reshaping our Earth. A lot of these actions or these decisions that we've made have changed our microbiome and impoverished it for the most part. We environmental microbiologists have been saying this for a very long time and trying to draw attention to it. Now that humanity has achieved health, it's a popular topic. The depletion of bacterial diversity in our intestinal microbiome is an important factor in many different diseases and is directly related to our diet. We've bred our fruits and many of our crops to be as big as possible or to be sweet and to yield a lot. In this respect, it's quite astonishing that the microbiomes of highly cultivated fruits really look similar to those of obese people in terms of structure. They are impoverished. They only have fast-growing microorganisms that already perform their function, but no longer perform other very important functions. The degradation of the human microbiome is a result of conventional farming. Birgit Birnstingel is a Demeter farmer who practices biodynamic fruit growing in Styria. She's not surprised by the impoverishment of the microbiome in and around us. I can see it quite plainly when I look at conventional fields, where I don't see a single plant growing where everything has simply been turned over, where nothing is allowed to grow, where of course there is no vitality, no liveliness. And when these conventional fields are then cultivated, there are only monocultures. Nothing else is allowed to grow and it's sprayed away. It's like eating schnitzel every day. Birgit Birnstingel harvests more than 20 different apple varieties in her orchards. You can't find such a selection in any supermarket. The microbiome in every apple variety is different in its composition. But if I always eat the same thing, then it's quite logical that my microbiome will be degraded. Consumers must be aware that with the apple they're eating, it has the entire microbiome of the orchard. This means that the microbiome of the soil, the variety of herbs and grasses that grow there is also ingested. And thus the consumer receives a smorgasbord of microorganisms that he or she can absorb. Birgit Wassermann analyzed the microbiome of apples at the Graz University of Technology and found clear differences. There's the same number of microorganisms, but the diversity, the number of different species, is simply lower in a conventionally farmed apple from the supermarket. The strongest and fastest microorganisms remain, and they're usually not the best for our health. In addition, the individual parts of the apple also have a different variety of microorganisms. The peel and core in particular stand out here, which is why we should throw as little as possible of an apple in the rubbish, or even better, nothing at all. I also eat the apple core. That's what I've always done. But since I've known that most of the microorganisms are actually in the core, I actually prefer to eat it much more. Gabriele Berg's research has also shown that pets and houseplants also make the human microbiome more diverse. 
while too much hygiene is rather problematic, especially in the household. Of course, if I buy a cleaning agent and it says 99.9% .9 of the microorganisms are destroyed by it, then 0.1% remain. These are the pathogens that develop from it. The important functional carriers that multiply slowly don't really have a chance in this life, and we need them for our health. A plea for diversity that not only applies to our environment, but even more to our intestines. That's why Andrea Ficciala makes sauerkraut for her microbiome gourmet menu from scratch and by hand. Quite a lot of people say you shouldn't wash your hands beforehand. Even top chefs say that in YouTube videos. But there are still enough lactic acid bacteria on your hands if you wash them normally with soap and water. But please don't disinfect them, because that would be really counterproductive. Basically, sauerkraut is a great product, also for the intestines, because it's probiotic and prebiotic at the same time. That means that on the one hand, it provides us with these living lactic acid bacteria, especially if we no longer heat it. And on the other hand, it's prebiotic. That means it provides the food for good intestinal bacteria. That is the dietary fibers that are in there. And the good intestinal bacteria feed on these dietary fibers and grow. So you encourage the growth of the bacteria you want to have. It's a bit of work, but with sauerkraut, it's absolutely worth it, because store bought sauerkraut is very often pasteurized and the lactic acid bacteria are destroyed. The homemade sauerkraut is accompanied by fried tofu, which contains many phytoestrogens that the beneficial intestinal bacteria love. Also, fried potatoes made from potatoes from the day before, which contain resistant starch that can only be digested in the microbiome in the large intestine. The luxury buffet for our bacterial colonizers is ready, with no meat, by the way. Meat doesn't provide good nutrition for our gut bacteria. That's why it makes sense to replace meat with other things. Tofu is particularly good. It's like cheese made from plants. So vegetables and tofu, as well as grain products, are valuable for our intestinal bacteria. The film crew clearly likes it too. Bon appétit.